Ready, give it to go. Terence, you first. Accio. Good. Bailey. Accio. Very good. Luke. Accio. Wonderful. Now Gretchen. Accio. Excellent. Now all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Accio Hogwarts Radio. This is Hogwarts Radio, episode 229 for January 13th, 2019. Hogwarts Radio is the official podcast for Wizarding News from HPANA, discussing all things Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts, and the rest of the Wizarding World. For the quickest up-to-date news on the franchise, make sure you check out wizarding.news. Hello everyone, and this is Hogwarts Radio, broadcasting to Harry Potter and Fantastic Beast fans since 2008. I'm Terrence Pinkston. And I'm Gretchen Rush. Our show can be found virtually anywhere online, such as iTunes, the Google Podcast app, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Radio Public, and other places where podcasts are aggregated. It doesn't matter where or how you listen, just make sure to tap the subscribe button and we guarantee you'll have a new episode each Sunday. We also invite you to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram so you never miss an update from the show. Don't forget, Hogwarts Radio is also on Patreon. By pledging, you'll have instant access to many benefits, including Into the Common Room, Behind the Scenes Planning of the Show, Hogshead Radio, and much more. Visit patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio to sign up today. Welcome to episode 229. Gretchen and I are here, and we released the Basilisk, who petrified Luke and Bailey. Then we locked them in the Chamber of Secrets and threw away the key. Finally. Cannot say how happy I am to do that. <laughs> So sick of those guys. Last week was like the first time I've seen him in forever. And I was like, ugh, you too. But we are pleased to welcome Sydney back to the show. Hi, Sydney. Hello. How is everyone today? I am doing good. I, I, I like to speak for everybody, apparently. I, I'm not going to speak for Gretchen. That's fine. Terrence is doing good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, we were talking in our Slack chat a few days ago on failed Wizarding World slogans. Like, I think we touched on this last episode whenever we were discussing Birdie Bots Every Flavor Beans. And we were like, God, who really likes those? Because that's my favorite Wizarding World candy. And it's like, what would a slogan for Birdie Bots Every Flavor Beans be? And I I don't know. I mean, like, uh, I'm thinking of horrible slogans. You know, kind of like that episode of Friends where Chandler is going into marketing and and he's like, they're skates for your feet. And he's talking about like rollerblades or something like that. You know, I, I, don't, I can't quite remember exactly what that is. But um, like for Birdie Bots Every Flavor Beans, it could be an adventure in every mouthful. <laughs> that's just oh. awful. That's awful. <laughs> also, people like put like full mouthfuls of Birdie Bots in their mouths. Like that's that's brave. Well, yeah, I was talking last week. I accidentally did that over Christmas because I forgot they were birdie bots and it was horrible, I will say. It was an adventure, too. So maybe it's a pretty accurate slogan. <laughs> oh, we'll see. There you go. How, how about this for like a Nimbus 2000? Surprisingly comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Comfortable if, for blood. I yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know about sitting on broomsticks if that's comfortable or not. Um, mm -hmm. See, that's one thing about the Wizarding World that got me is like, how could sitting on a broom ever be comfortable? Magic. <laughs> sure. True. I, I wonder if like, <laughs> like you you know how you get like saddle sore? You could be like broomstick store <laughs> or something. <laughs> How about extendable ears? Like, they could be extendable ears. We have nothing to do with the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I'm not cut out for wizarding marketing. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what a few more would be. Like, flu powder. Better not say the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> Get it right. Right. Get it right the first time. Well, we know I have a future career in podcasting thank god but it's not in marketing so i'm i'm happy about that but anyway that's just some of the crap that flows through my mind sometimes so i'm like hey this would be good for the show let's go ahead and put it on there anyway let's get to a, a couple of twitter shout outs that we have this week shout out to our good friend tiffany from the swish and flick podcast we invite you to give them a listen as well hilarious and informative group of ladies i have to say we've had them on the show 
uh, quite a few times. So definitely give them a listen. And yeah, thank you, Tiffany, for responding. I know I did it kind of quick. Usually we'll get all of our responses after we record our episode. So <laughs> if we missed you, we'll try to grab you for next week's episode. Well, Gretchen, what's been going on in the Wizarding News cycle? Well, after our last episode came out, we had a pretty exciting announcement that directly related to our episode. So it was very funny timing. We got the release date for the Goblet of Fire Illustrated Edition. So Bloomsbury has revealed that it will be published on October 8th, 2019. So this fall, just like we thought. And they've confirmed that the book will include the original text, complete and unabridged, just like the other ones, with a foiled jacket, head and tail bands, a ribbon marker, and illustrated end papers. A deluxe edition will also be released with a real cloth cover and slipcase, intricate foiled line art decorating both case and slipcase, an opulent large format, and gilt edges. Um, so it's not available for pre-order yet, but once it is, we'll let you know. So that exclusive deluxe edition... That sounds sick. Yeah, that, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, have they done that for the other ones? I don't think so. I don't remember hearing about them. Hmm. Oh, it sounds really nice. Like, yeah. I want that for my coffee table, just like that one specifically. Also, I feel like it's going to be like giant because huge. the whole fire is huge. So it's going to be a gigantic book. Like, what are they going to do for Order of the Phoenix once that one comes out? Like, I know. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, that's interesting. Do we know a price at all? They have not released a price yet. I'm guessing I, I'm trying to remember what I paid for the other ones. It was probably between 20 and 30 probably higher towards 30 um so i'm guessing this one's got to be at least 30 but that, that's gonna be like 50 dollars. that's what i, mean, I was with just all thinking. those bells and whistles that they're putting on that <laughs> i'm saying at least 50 dollars. yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that's that's I would say that's pretty accurate uh, right around the 50 mark, because, uh, you know, as we as the books start to increase in size, I mean, it's natural that the price should go up. I would expect to pay more for it. Um, and in fact, I would want to pay a little bit more for it because you're getting more content. You're getting more illustrations. Um, you're just getting more bang for your buck. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I feel like Order of the Phoenix is going to be so crazy because they are keeping them unabridged, but they're also adding in all these beautiful beautiful illustrations and taking away space for the text so it's just got to be i mean i can't wait to see it i'm thrilled how many people surprised that they're not like splitting these up into like goblet of fire part one goblet of fire part two like mm-hmm. because that's not gonna be like gigantic it's gonna be heavy it won't be readable it's, really yeah. <laughs> it's no. gonna be like king james bible big you know <laughs> <laughs> like here's the here's this book it just sits on my coffee table i can't actually read it because right. i can't pick it up like, i mean i can't open it. it it sounds like you're gonna be able to like level your bed with these like raise your bed up on <laughs> platforms you know um yeah. nonetheless I'm, I'm excited for this um and and the the illustrated editions, I, I went and picked the other three up the other day. Uh, it wasn't too bad. It did cost about $100 for all of them. Um, so, I, you know, of course, it's what I expected. And hey, if you're going to start collecting them, start collecting them now to where you only pay like 20 to $30 for each book because... If you wait until the entire series comes out, you're looking at upwards of maybe $200 for all of these books, all of these illustrated editions. So our next piece of news is about the BAFTA nominations. So these came out in some Potter people were nominated. So for original music, Alexander Desplat, um, who composed the music for Deathly Hallows parts one and two. He was nominated for the film Isle of Dogs. And in the production design and the special visual effects design, Crimes of Grindelwald was nominated. So that's very cool. And then Alfonso Coran, who directed the third movie, he has this new film Roma. It's actually on Netflix. and I've been meaning to watch it. A ton of um, nominations and a lot of buzz around it. So he was nominated and that film was nominated for director, original screenplay, film not in English, cinematography, and editing. Cool stuff. The, the, you know, award season is about to kick off. Mm-hmm. Um, so do we expect Fantastic Beasts at all to, you know, be nominated? I mean, here it is at the BAFTA, um, nominated for production design, special visual effects, which, I mean, yes, I, I totally agree with these nominations and 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 definitely think it has a strong chance of winning. What about the Academy Awards that are coming up here in about a month? Do we think that... It could possibly be nominated for any category. Anything strong that you guys might think. I have a feeling if it was going to get nominated before kind of like your, your typical stuff, like what they won last time for costuming, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I feel like that. it would probably be something like that. No, best picture supporting. It. I can't think of any of those. But I, that doesn't mean like down the line that they won't be as these 
films get like better and better. So I have faith one day we'll get a nomination. Yeah. <laughs> Would it be yeah. would it be disappointing if it didn't win anything at all, or is that kind of expected? I mean, the Wizarding World films have always been snubbed at you know the Oscars and and other high end uh, award shows. Yeah, I'm not expecting it to win anything. And honestly, like this this day and age, we have so many technically proficient movies uh, that. It, you look at this movie and of course the effects are wonderful, but there are so many other movies that are doing it and doing new things. This is now the ninth movie and the same effects that we've already seen. And some of them are a little different, a little tweaked, but ultimately I think there are so many other contenders now that, I mean, if they weren't going to nominate the Harry Potter films and they were doing them for the first time, I don't know why they would nominate the second Fantastic Beasts film. And I don't really care, honestly. Yeah, I think I think the fandom as a whole is really over it. Um, they're, they're, and rightly so. I mean, there's a lot of people that were disappointed that the Potter films didn't pick up and, and get the attention of you know the Oscars like it should have. I mean, we're, we keep mentioning the Oscars, but it's like the, the, the top of the top of the award shows. So... Um, you know, I yeah, I don't expect Fantastic Beasts to really kind of pick up anything. Maybe production, maybe production design, um, and costuming, uh, but it really didn't have anything that stood out like as far as music and best original screenplay stuff like that. Although that would be well, cool for J.K. Rowling to win best original screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the score was really good. Like this is one of my very favorite potter like wizarding world scores actually mm -hmm. so i i mean maybe they could get something for that that would be really neat if that happened but i don't really picture it happening for any of the other kind of major awards well we shall see yeah, yeah we'll see yes we will in other news the new cursed child on broadway cast was announced it was a couple weeks ago at this point but we were so busy and on hiatus that we didn't get a chance to actually talk about the people who are filling in these roles so obviously, Cursed Child on Broadway, right now, the majority of the people who are the main cast members came from the London production. So they're the original people, and people who are going to see the Broadway show have gotten to see those original Londoner cast. Um, a majority of them were all British. And now we're going to have Broadway equity actors coming in and replacing those people, which means the majority of them are not British. In fact... None of them are British. So let's talk about who is going to be filling in these iconic roles. So Harry Potter it will be played by James Snyder. You may know him from the musicals on Broadway, Crybaby, If Then, and In Transit. Um, and in a video from the first day of rehearsal, he expressed his shock at being involved in the production. He said, in my wildest dreams, I would have never been in this play. I'm still in disbelief, and I think a lot of us are just still giddy with what it means to be a part of this world. The video is super cute. Everyone is really, really adorable. I don't care that they're not British. They're great. Mm -hmm. So also joining him is Diane Davis as Ginny and Nicholas Padeni as Albus Severus. And playing Ron is Broadway newbie Matt Mueller. And playing Hermione Granger will be Jenny Jules, who made her Broadway debut in 2016. Nadia Brown will be playing Rose Granger Weasley. And Draco Malfoy will be played by New Zealander Jonah Roberts with Bubba Wheeler or Weiler probably playing his son Scorpius Malfoy. So the only name I recognize in this bunch was James Snyder. I am familiar with those musicals he was in and he's very good in those musicals. So I'm excited and he's really adorable. Um, but the rest of them I didn't know. And obviously there's one New Zealander, but all the rest of them are American as far as I can tell. Um, so it is going to be different, I think, to have American actors finally playing these iconic roles on an American stage. What do you guys think? So is Cursed Child, does that have any, uh, I mean, I know it has its own score but is there any singing involved with it is no. there none not at all so nope. it's just it's just a play yep like, it's wow. a play. okay okay see i'm not I'm not much of a theater going type uh, i mean just because you know i'm nowhere near um any place that really has um you know shows i mean every once in a while they will have a, a few down here and i'm not able to to catch up, but um, I've heard a lot of a lot of positive buzz about James Snyder from his previous roles, especially about In Transit. So I'm I'm definitely looking forward to seeing 
um, how these American actors are going to portray these characters. Yeah, it's exciting. Also, do we know, are they going to um, have British accents or are they going to uh, like just have their normal talking voice, do you think? I think they must be doing accents because these are, I mean, it's not a Potter-inspired story. You know, it is a story about Harry Potter. So they must be doing accents. Mm -hmm. I hope those are good for them because (laughs) otherwise people are not probably going to be happy. So, so yeah. Gretchen, Could you're be risky. Gretchen, you're one. Of, you're you're the theater goer out of the group. You know, you you've yeah. gone to a couple Broadway shows. Um, uh, who, aside from James Snyder, any anybody you're really looking forward to seeing? I don't know any of these other guys, but watching the video, Nicholas Padani was super cute. He's playing Albus Severus, and he was just so adorable. And he he talked a bit in the video about how nervous he was, and he said he was a little over eager to be joining the cast. Um, and he said, I always assumed a project like Harry Potter would attract people who are generous. And that's exactly what's happened. So uh, it's really, really exciting to watch these new actors in, in the video. They're kind of getting to know each other and they're um, doing games to to really mash as a family and as a group. Um, so I think that they all just look like they're having a blast and it's great to be getting some fresh energy to the show now that it's been on Broadway for a while and we've had that original cast now we can say all right let's go see these new people and see what they're doing and how they're kind of embodying those roles so I I mean you know I'm gonna see it one day so maybe this is the cast I see <laughs> you know it's a it's a good point a lot of a lot of positive uh, energy is what I'm I'm seeing from from this group so it's definitely someone, something to keep your eye on as far as this cast. And like you said, Gretchen, maybe this is the one that is mm-hmm. our cast that would go and see the, the play. We'll see. Yeah, that is it for the news. Okie dokie. And let's move on to an email that we have for you. And I'm so sorry to this, uh, this listener. <laughs> she emailed us uh, at, gosh, around the holidays. And uh, we're just now getting to her. But yeah, we're, we're just we're, we're, we're just going to go ahead and, and, and respond to her here on the show instead of just typing out the email. So she goes, Hello, this is Kylie Olson. I'm a super big Harry Potter fan. And I absolutely love your podcast. It is heartwarming that there's adults that appreciate the series as much as I do. I love all of your comments, theories and jokes. Oh, thank you. That go on during each and every show. I'm a Hufflepuff. I'm in my fourth year, or at least I would be, and I found out that the series, that if the series actually existed, then I would be the same age as James Sirius Potter, who would have been 14 in the year 2018, which I thought was really cool. I live two hours away from Universal Orlando, and I'm so frustrated that I haven't been to the Harry Potter Wizarding World yet. In fact, I find myself almost crying when someone says they have been. It's that bad you can laugh all you want but as Hermione has taught me you have to love yourself (laughs) you also have to have a love of the book of books which I do especially if they have 500 pages or more which is wonderful in my opinion I hope you've enjoyed this and I wish you all the best and a happy new year which just so happens to be my birthday well thank you for the email Kylie and happy belated birthday yeah happy birthday hope it was a good one yeah yeah (laughs) Definitely, uh, and, and and email us if you ever get the chance to make it down to Orlando. I think you'll have a great time at the theme park. Yes, you can do it, Kylie. I believe in you. You'll get there just like I'm going to get to Curse Child. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have wishful thinking. I have high hopes. You know. You know what? Maybe maybe I'll make that my challenge. We all know how I, how I like challenges. Right. Maybe I'll make your that. Your New Year's resolution is to get to Curse Child. That will be my <laughs> new New Year's resolution. Actually, I haven't set a New Year's resolution yet. So um, that's going to be a goal, I think. We'll take it off of the bucket list and put it on the 2019 list. There you go. Sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have an, uh, a question or a comment about anything that we've said on the show, send us an email to staff at HogwartsRadio.com. We'd love to read it on the air. Let's go through a couple of announcements before we get to today's discussion. Do you want even more Hogwarts Radio? Even more of this? Yes, you do. The answer is yes. <laughs> Consider donating to our show over on Patreon. Only four more patrons are needed until we hit our next goal. That's it. Just four more, you guys. And if we hit a total of 15 patrons, which is four more from now, we're going to extend the runtime of our show to an hour and a half instead of just the hour. So you're going to get an additional half hour of Hogwarts Radio if we get four more patrons. And that's at any level. 
You know, you can be either a first year or a sixth year. It doesn't matter uh, what level it is. We just need four more patrons until we hit that next goal. We'd love to be able to sit here and talk for hours on end, in which some cases we do. We'd like to give you guys an hour and a half show every week. I think that would be fun. Also, we are looking for another part-time host for the show. Casting call, that's right. Doesn't matter if you're British... If you're American, you have an accent. Ooh, that would be a plus, though. That'd be awesome. I love accents. <laughs> but if you have two nights a month free to record with us, that's it. Just two nights a month. And you want to talk Fantastic Beasts and Harry Potter, send us an email to staff at HogwartsRadio.com, and we'd love to discuss it with you about joining our team. And finally, don't forget to rate and review our podcast on iTunes. This week, we're specifically looking for iTunes reviews. So if you listen to us on an Apple device, or you have the ability to get iTunes, just uh, leave us a comment right there at the bottom on our show page. We greatly appreciate it. Okay, guys, so our discussion this week is going to sit around just a few questions. I was picking and choosing around the online community. Um, and I thought this one, this first one here, it would be pretty interesting. If you had the opportunity to talk to any character from the Wizarding World, who would it be and why? It doesn't even have to be somebody you like. Um, it could just be whoever you want. So Gretchen, let's go ahead and start with you. Well, it's funny that you say it doesn't have to be someone you like, because my first thought was Draco Malfoy, just because I want to see like how annoying he is. Um, but then I was like, nah, it's stupid. So <laughs> I ended up picking Ginny. Because I just think she is awesome, and I feel like we would have a lot in common, a lot to talk about. We could head out for a game of Quidditch. We could go to the Hogshead and just chill, and we could chat about like life and broomsticks and stuff. And I could learn about if a broomstick's actually comfortable. So yeah, I picked Jenny Weasley because I think she's bomb. dot com. Jenny. Jenny. <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> no, not Jenny. Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not her. Uh, Who did you pick, Terrence? I picked Dumbledore. And we all know how I feel about Dumbledore. And, and you know, this doesn't even have to be young Dumbledore or, or old Dumbledore. Yep. It just has Dumbledore. to be... Yeah, it just has to be Dumbledore in general. Um, so wh while I do have issues with him, um, he is incredibly wise. He's very, very smart. Uh, there's a lot of information in his head. And sometimes I would really like to hear his advice on certain situations you know certain real life situations uh, especially you know, i feel like he could put a lot of things into context for me you know he he could be like the one that kind of calms me down when i'm having like a freak out or something like that you know he just he could be dumbledore and put all of his dumbledoreness onto me um i i i just I would I would like to just really get to know why he thinks the way that he thinks on some things. Yeah, Dumbledore would be cool to have a conversation with. Just sit down, chat about life. Yeah, I mean, it, and I mean, he's like a hundred and something years old. If I'm talking to old Dumbledore, he's like a hundred and something years old, right? So he's had a lot of life experience. So he's definitely someone that you can talk to about some situation that you're going through. Also, I bet if you're like just like going out and like getting a drink with him or like having like a cup of coffee, he'll probably bring candy. So like that's dope. You'd be able to eat all like this yummy candy that he loves so much. So yeah, yeah. I have some lemon drops with you. Yeah. <laughs> Priorities. Make sure he's got candy. Yeah. I'll got Jenny. It's like one of those older relatives, you go and visit them, right? And they always have candy or cookies or something. <laughs> Let's talk to Grandpa Dumbledore today. He's like, back in my day, I fought Grindelwald. <laughs> That's nice, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Sydney? Who would you like to have a discussion with from the Wizarding World. So funny enough, Gretchen said she thought about Draco first. <laughs> and I was like, man, nah, no, he'd be too annoying. I would love to have a conversation with Draco. <laughs> um, but like post Wizarding World uh, war, like I need him like, I don't know, like three, four or five years after the series ended. Mm. I just want to like know more about Draco as like just a person, like, how did you become who you are? And like, who are you like however many years later? Because for me, Draco is one of the most interesting characters in this series. Like you just like loathe him the entire series. He's annoying, he's awful. And then Half-Blood Prince hits and he becomes like a lot more complex. And so I would love to like just have a conversation with him 
I'd love to find out, like, why didn't you tell people who Harry was at Malfoy Manor? Like, how did all these things all shape you? So I would love to talk to Draco. But specifically, three, four, or five years down the line, Draco. Not Draco as, like, 11-year-old Draco. Right. Well, that is one of the things, like, Half-Blood Prince has always been my favorite book, and that is one of the things that I found most intriguing, was that whole Draco plotline and Harry trying to figure it all out. I was like, oh, this is so interesting. It's so fun to see something else besides him being like, oh, Potter, you suck. Yeah. So I I really, I do agree with you. I'm, I'm with you. I, I kind of feel like Draco, even after the Wizarding War, would be that same kind of sour person, but have a deeper understanding and a deeper appreciation for people that are not working against him you know he still has those those really slytherin-esque qualities where uh you know he he's still cunning he's still gonna be that annoying git that we all know through throughout the series but i i feel like he he isn't as uh I'm not going to say prejudice. Well, yeah, he he wouldn't be as prejudiced towards his peers, but still the same old sour person. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. I just feel like Draco, like, also, like, probably grew up in, like, a really bad environment. <laughs> like, awful parents. So yeah. I feel like he got away from that. And he maybe was like, oh, well, yeah, I was, like, a pretty, like, awful person. Maybe I need to change that, so. <laughs> I feel like he would be a really good politician. <laughs> Uh, but that's a story for another day, I think. Uh, the next question I have is astronomy class at midnight. So according to this thread on Reddit, astronomy class for first years is held at midnight on Wednesdays, according to the Harry Potter Wikipedia. If this is true, how did 11-year-olds stay up that late and then go to class the next morning? It would be pretty bad sleep schedule if they just napped in the afternoon and then stayed up all night. What do you guys think? I was just rereading Sorcerer's Stone, uh, like, very recently, and I got to that part, and I was like, I forgot they had class at midnight. Like, <laughs> what the heck? They're 11. Like, they need their sleep. I like to think that, like, class the next day just starts later, maybe. So, like, you have, like, a late start or something. But, I mean, yeah. that's so late. Like, what are you doing the rest of the day? Is that your only class? Are you just taking naps beforehand like so many questions yeah that would yeah that, that's what i thought that maybe just thursday classes like they've worked the schedule so it's the same amount of classes but like maybe you start a bit later on wednesday and then you have class all day and night and then you start later on thursday and just have class for a little bit like i don't know <laughs> yeah i mean that would really th if they started class later that would really still throw their schedules off because i would imagine like breakfast is the same time every morning regardless of what time you have class you know because you still have other students that might not be that that aren't taking those classes you know that they're getting to bed at like a normal hour and and, and stuff like that so you know i can't imagine and how it must be throwing their, you know, not just their sleep schedule off, but th their food schedule as well. Like, do they just skip breakfast? As an 11 year old, I don't know. I couldn't imagine skipping breakfast, especially when I have to, whenever I have to use my brain all day. Like, food is brain power, yo. Mm hmm. Yeah. What's weird to me is that it starts at midnight. Like, couldn't it start at like 11 and maybe end at midnight? Because then they could still get like seven and a half hours of sleep, make it to breakfast, just like. Did it need to start at midnight, really? And how long are the classes? And right, like, is it only on Wednesdays? I mean, is this like a once a week class? Because I know in college, whenever I had a once a week class, it was like a three hour class. So if this starts at midnight, you know, these these poor kids aren't getting out to like three in the morning. I don't know. Sad. Yeah, late night watching the stars. <laughs> I'd be like, screw astronomy. <laughs> I wonder, is it something they have to take as first years? Yeah, I think so. If I remember right, I'm pretty sure it's like a required class that um, all first years must take astronomy and it starts at midnight. Part of their Don't core know. curriculum or something yeah, like that. So. Then it becomes an elective later on. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I think so. Okay. Let's see. The, another question. We talked about this last week a bit. But would Newt be able to tame a basilisk? Now, if you guys remember uh, last week's episode, we asked if Newt was able to study Dementors. This week, we'd like to talk if he ever had the chance to study very, very dangerous basilisk. And it was never mentioned in the series if Dumbledore explicitly knew about the basilisk inside of the castle. So could that also be Newt's basilisk? 
And I mean, how long do basilisks really live? Well, hasn't that basilisk been down there for like hundreds of years, if I remember correctly? Like it was Salazar Slytherins. So it's been down there for a really long time. So, yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking about that. Um, and okay, so the basilisk, if it was put in the Chamber of Secrets by Slytherin, it had, it, it has to be almost a thousand years old, right? Yeah. So what? I mean, obviously you got to have substance. You got to have you got to have food. You got to have you know. I mean, there's plenty of water down there and stuff. But like, I, I just don't see a snake surviving for a thousand years down in the chamber of secrets with like nothing to eat and all that other stuff. I I, I don't know. But Terrence, magic. <laughs> right, magic. Does it need Does it need food when it has magic? I don't know. No. But, uh, <laughs> but I don't think that, um, I mean, I don't think that Newt would be able to tame a basilisk. He, he doesn't speak parcel tongue as far as we're aware, right? So I feel like that's like very important. Yeah, that, that's absolutely a must is to speak parcel tongue. That, that's really the only thing that could fail him is like somebody else that speaks parcel tongue who actively tries to stop a basilisk from getting tamed, right? So I, again, this comes back to it was a basilisk ever included in the book fantastic beasts and where to find them yes yeah because yes this says that um newt's commander stated in the 52nd edition of fantastic beasts and where to find them that there have been no recorded sightings of basilisks in britain for the last 400 years harry potter wrote in his copy of the book that's what you think (laughs) (laughs) nice so yeah i guess maybe he just Mm -hmm. never had the chance because he's like well these aren't around so i can't ever study them even if you know i feel like newt would learn parcel tongue he would dedicate himself to that even though it's probably not possible but he would try i think i mean he could he could figure out some phrases he just has to find a friend that speaks parcel tongue right and then yeah i figured out some phrases (laughs) (laughs) Right? <laughs> Sounds great to me. You could run it. <laughs> I, okay, so it says although uh, an average basilisk is said to have an average lifespan of 900 years, Sal- Salazar Slytherin's basilisk lived for approximately 1,000 years, being there since his, since Slytherin built the Chamber of Secrets around that time. Okay, so that that's pretty cool. I think it survived on hate. It was just fueled by the hatred of Slytherin. <laughs> See, as described by Pine the Elder, basilisks don't get very large, only the length of 12 fingers. However, in nature, snapes, snapes, <laughs> snapes, Jesus, snakes don't stop growing until they die. So it could explain why a basilisk, which can live over 900 years, would get so huge. Huh. Okay, well, the more you know then. Wow, okay, so that's like one beast that Newt hadn't, re- has not had the ability to study. Can you imagine him keeping a basilisk in his Newt case? I feel like they would kind of look like the little, those were the Akami, right? Like the little mm-hmm. snake-like looking things? Yeah. I feel like he could just have like little basilisk too. <laughs> so I wonder if, if the basilisks would be f- like say they have the same effect, you know, because they're only the length of twelve fingers, which really isn't, you know, it's it's not that long. They're probably at most like five feet. So if you still look into its eyes, will you still get petrified, or does it have to be like a bigger length, like a lo- like a bigger snake, like the one of in, in the Chamber of Secrets? Very interesting stuff we don't know about basilisks because Newt never got to study them. I know. Now we'll never know. J.K. Rowling, get on that. It's a Pottermore article waiting to happen. <laughs> All right, the next thing we have to discuss, Accio Niffler. So Newt couldn't Accio the Niffler in Fantastic Beast 1, but had no problem doing it in Crimes of Grindelwald. Is that just a continuity error or lazy writing? So um, this has been a big topic since the movie came out. A lot of people are asking this question, and I've seen a few different things. So Pottermore specifically says that it can be used on an animal, but J.K. Rowling's website says that it can only be used on inanimate things. So we need a final word here. I mean, I'm inclined to trust J.K. Rowling, but then she wrote the script where Newt used it on animals. So what's happening here? Very true. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if if you can't, I mean, if it had to be like an inanimate object, well, can't you just accio the coins that are in the Niffler and, you know, summon the right. Niffler to you like that? Or do, do they just fly out of the Niffler's pouch? Or pocket, I would think so. I mean, at that point. Well, and I feel like I remember hearing this before. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't have the script book. But doesn't it say like the the spell like or um, 
incantation and like it says accio and that's in like um italics and then like the niffler part is like not and then just also added the word niffler which also just doesn't really clear anything up yeah what how does that help <laughs> right <laughs> exactly i i just don't uh yeah, it, it might be like one of those continuity errors in magic, you know. Um you can't you can't su- you can't you can summon well see if that was the case, I mean there's just so much yeah, never mind. No, it's just a continuity error, I think. It's not lazy writing, it's just one of those things in magic that JK Rowling might have forgot about. You know, one of those one of those properties of magic that JK Rowling forgot about. Um, well, I'm also interested that if it says that on Pottermore that you can act on animal, then like was that changed after the movie when they were like Oh no, we broke him. <laughs> right like, now we know that no, you no, we'll do it. it. Yeah. We watched the movie. Now it's packed. <laughs> well, if so, they need to be changing a lot more things on Pottermore. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, another kind of thought that I had, and this is more of a of a sidebar here, but does anybody feel like we're getting too much Dumbledore in these films? Uh, I mean, uh, okay, we've only gotten Dumbledore in one film, but it felt like. It was more Dumbledore centric, even though we saw him just for a few minutes. Um, you know, I, I personally, I'd love to learn more about Newton, his adventures. But given we're so immersed, like in this Dumbledore Grindelwald story arc right now, it seems like the story is just more Dumbledore Grindelwald centric. And is is that more due to the point of where we're at in the story, or is it this is going to be something that's going to be drawn out over the next few movies? It's going to be something that's drawn out more over the next few movies. And honestly, like I'm completely okay with that. I've kind of like since the beginning of this, and especially like once we started learning more about what the plot of um, Crimes of Grindelwald was, I think it was like pretty clear that they're steering it towards this direction of ending it with that final battle between the two of them um so it makes sense that they would kind of start focusing on Dumbledore more and more and more and I'm excited for that because I love Dumbledore and I want to learn everything possible um about him but I I understand if people are like no we want the beasts we care about Newt but I just feel like we're moving in that direction where it's gonna be more Dumbledore yeah, I agree. It almost feels like the first movie she introduced these characters just to have characters in this world because she's like, "Ooh, I really am interested in Dumbledore and Grindelwald, so that's where I'm going." But I guess I'll start with these characters and I'll start with this story and then that way I'll have a frame for the story. So I'll set it in this world with these characters and then I'll introduce Dumbledore and then we'll go from there. So it's like Especially when you think about the other characters, not even just new, but like Queenie, Tina, Jacob, Credence. I feel like they all are just kind of fitting in that framework that she's created, Dumbledore. So in a way, I guess I do feel like it's too much Dumbledore because if that was the story you wanted to tell, tell that story. I'm all I'm here for that. Absolutely. But you started with the Beast and the man who loves the Beast. And I was kind of there for that story. So... I'm a little split on what I want out of the series. Well, I guess too. Like I'm kind of excited then um, to see kind of how these different characters that we've come to love, Queenie, Tina, Newt, Jacob, like how are these guys going to fit into like the Dumbledore Grindelwald storyline? Like what role are they going to play in all of this? Because I feel like they're going to have to play obviously an important role because otherwise we wouldn't be, (laughs) this wouldn't be a, a, five-part movie series would just right. have like a trilogy or something like that. Yeah, and they wouldn't be in the movie to begin with. So mm-hmm. that's what I can't wrap my brain around. Where in the world is Jacob going to fit in in the next three films? I don't see it happening, but now they're not going to cut the character. So I, I just don't... I guess I'm baffled as to why she would tar- start us with these characters and this story and then want to veer in this other direction where, I mean, I read a lot of books, I watch a lot of movies, and I cannot... <laughs> imagine where she's going to fit these characters in well maybe then it's not necessarily going in this the direction that we all think it is like maybe we're all like wrong and this isn't going in the heavy of the Dumbledore direction as it <laughs> appears to be like I'd give it to JK JKR to be the one to be like eh, you think we're going this way actually we're more going you know a little bit to the left 
<laughs> this I whole movie is about basilisks now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, given given the big reveal at the end of the movie, it, you know, it just adds another Dumbledore character to the mix. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like I I think. I'd have to agree. This is the direction that she's going in. In fact, Sydney, you and I were having this interesting discussion in our Patreon Slack chat uh, earlier today where the next title of the movie, we're kind of thinking, has to include Dumbledore in the title. Yeah, I definitely think it's going to include Dumbledore in the title. Not just because I think that's going to be a focus of it, but uh, in part because like the conversations you guys have had in the past, have had in the past, like they need it for <laughs> marketing reasons. Um but I 100% think that Dumbledore is going to be in the title somewhere. So if we were looking at this, like uh, transitioning to, to title discussion just for a moment here, um, if we looked at all the Wizarding World films, right? Sorcerer's Stone referred to an object. Chamber of Secrets is a place. Prisoner of Azkaban is a person. Goblet of Fire is an object. Order of the Phoenix, group of people. Half-Blood Prince is a person. Deathly Hallows is an object. Um, uh, I'm kind of thinking, since Crimes of Grindelwald r- referred to a person, well, this this next movie has to refer to a person as well. You know, it's it's like the destiny of the Dumbledores or something like that. Um, you know, it it just really wouldn't surprise me if they they kind of spun the story in that direction. It would. It, it, and it's not the direction that I wish that they would go in as a fan, but of course I have no creative control over the movie. Uh, but still, I just, I, I mean, I, I look, I, I'm all for getting more in, in, in new information, a flushed out story of the Dumbledores. But as far as a centric movie, uh, you know, like you said, Gretchen, they started with the beasts, you know, let's continue with the beasts. Let's not go in this different direction. You know, even though that she's going to tie it in and and already that feels like too too much information to kind of consume in in a movie format. So I feel like we're going to have the same problem in movie three as we had in movie two was just an overload of information. I mean, even just kind of thinking through it. I don't know. Yeah. And I think that so so it's so hard, like right now, because we're in like kind of like the, the throes of it and we're in the you know movie two of five. So I'm you know, we're all kind of like a lot of us are frustrated with where things are at right now and the amount of information that we've gotten. But I think by the time we get to movie five, like it's going to feel a lot better and maybe we'll have like a better understanding of like why each movie is the way that it was. Um, which is why, why I just continue to think that the next movie is going to be more focused on Dumbledore. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, she is laying the path for the story, right? In movie two, I mean, this might not be a, a direction that the fans were expecting or wanted her to go in, and that's fine, you know. But we've w- what people have to remember is that this is just a stepping stone in the overall picture. This is a piece of the puzzle, and we're not getting the entire puzzle until movie five is concluded. Um, and I hope that you know everything is going to be wrapped up by then. I mean, it should just title Fantastic Beast 3. We're really, really sorry. <laughs> I think that would be... <laughs> the Dumbledore's apology. The Dumbledore's apology. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I got it. Fantastic Beast 3. Dumbledore spills it all. <laughs> <laughs> that would never uh, happen. <laughs> you know, Dumbledore I, spills nothing. <laughs> in the next movie, I would not be surprised if... Dumbledore says, come here, Newt, I'm going to tell you everything. You know, that <laughs> the classic Dumbledore-ness where he really doesn't, he's like, oh, I'm going to tell you everything. And then he doesn't tell you really anything. I'd be super mad if she pulled that, though. Yeah. Yeah, I would, too. Can't deal with that again. <laughs> but see, that's that's J.K. Rowling's writing. You know, that's... that's in, gotta roll with it. It's an expected direction that she could possibly go with the series. So... I don't know. It's it's we're in for a wild ride, I think. I hope so. Okay, guys, before we get out of here today, we're going to play a game of Vada Kedavra, Amortentia and Imperio. So it's going to go me to Gretchen, Gretchen to Sydney and then Sydney back to me. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> All right. Gretchen, your three are Mundungus Fletcher, Ugh. Tom the Innkeeper from the Three Broomsticks. 
And Argus Filch. Ugh. <laughs> Those are rough. Those are terrible. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um. You look like you have a bad taste in your mouth right now. <laughs> Those are awful. No. Well, I can't think of um, Filch without thinking of his Game of Thrones character, so I'm going to have to kill him because um, that just wouldn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll kill Filch. Um, I'll Imperio Mundungus because at least he can, like, well, Tom's a business owner. Ooh, uh, she's thinking about this economically. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, well, yeah. but you know what? Mundungus can steal you more stuff. So Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I'm gonna Imperial Mundungus and he can like do my my dirty deeds or whatever and go out and steal stuff for me. And then I'll um what's the what's the name of the last thing? Tom? The innkeeper? No. Oh no. um uh Amortentia. Amortentia. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, I'll Amortentia Tom. I'll, I'll stick in his coffee and then we'll be like um the innkeeper and the innkeeper's wife and name is. <laughs> nice. <That'll be> us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So okay. there you have it. All right, Sydney, yours are not nearly as bad. Um I'm super <laughs> lazy, so I'm picking the three people we picked to talk to in the wizarding world. So your choice I is gonna do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. I got you first. Your choices are Draco, Dumbledore, or Ginny. Oh, jeez. Oh. <laughs> I even though I really wanted to have a conversation with him, I'm gonna have to kill kill Draco. Yeah. Um. Uh, hmm. I am going to Imperial Dumbledore. Yes. <laughs> I love how she. Kidding. You went up like four octaves whenever you said that too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel great about that. But Dog. I feel like Dumbledore would understand. Maybe Dogs like are going to be. the bind that I was in. He, he would understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. That means I have to come up with new ones. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. Terrence. Sure. Let's do Ludo Bagman. Okay. Uh, Gilderly Lockhart. Okay. And Dollish. Dollish. The Dollish. The Orr. Okay. Um, wow. Okay. So uh, I'm going to have to Amortentia Dollish because uh, he's an Auror, so he can protect me. Um, and we will fall in love and have uh, many, many kids, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm going to Imperio Lockhart um, and have him appear on the show every week. I think that would uh, that would be good. People would like to hear from Lockhart. Yeah, that's almost like doable, that one. Yeah. I mean, but what do you do with Smarmy and Gilderoy around the same time? Ooh, Luke Hart and Lockhart. Tough. That's going to be a... <laughs> boy, that would be a battle there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. And then I, and then obviously I would Avada Kedavra Ludo Bagman because I can't think of anything that dude would be good for. <laughs> nah. Not Ludo unless, not unless you guys can. I, no, Ludo's kind of useless. Okay. No, no, he's not useless. He's really good at evading doing what he needs to do. Well, then maybe that's why you should Imperial Ludo. <laughs> because finally, finally do what he's supposed to. Ludo Bagman, the master procrastinator. <laughs> <laughs> seriously he's like yeah well, i'll be right back i'll be right back i swear like you guys are doing awesome and then he runs away you, fake gold. <laughs> you know i'm so sad they got him from the movie because yeah. i actually really I, enjoyed that book. I was about to say yeah the people that just have watched the movies and not read the books and listened to our show are like who the hell is Ludo bagman <laughs> oh, he's a favorite character. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really enjoyable yeah okay well that does it for this week's episode, let's, uh, you know, we haven't done this in a while. Let's go ahead and, and kind of plug our other projects. Um, Gretchen, what else do you work on in addition to our show? Where can people find you? You can find me on the Twitters and the Instagrams at Gretchen Sketcha. There's an A on the end because Gretchen Sketch was taken. Um, right now I'm tweeting about tidying up with Marie Kondo on Netflix. And I have yet to start the tidying process. I just sit on my couch and watch other people tidy. Um, but eventually maybe I'll start it myself and then I'll tweet about that. Um, you can also find me on mugglenet.com. I am the assistant news team manager and I write articles over there so you can find me there. Um, do I do anything else? 
Don't you do an nope. article for uh, Loops Network, right? Yes, I do. Thank you. I knew there was something I was missing. So the podcast that dot com. I write blogs over there. Last month's blog was about. Oh my gosh, I wrote it so long ago. Nope. This month's blog is about the podcast that floats down here. So if you're a fan of Stephen King, look out for a blog about their most recent episode coming soon. Cool beans. Sydney, what about you? Where can everybody find your works online? So you can follow me on Instagram at Sydney Moo. So it's my name without the K. Um, I post lots of pictures of my cats. And I also uh, post a lot of pictures about how cold it is in North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, on Twitter, you can find me at Sydney underscore Mook. Uh, where I tweet a lot about uh, the news because I am a journalist for my day job. Um, and I tweet also a lot about the New York Yankees uh, and the Kentucky Wildcats. So if you like sports and fodder and news, uh, that's a good spot for you. Because I, I tend to tweet a lot about all of those. Well, very, very cool. You guys can check me out over on Twitter at twitter.com slash Terencius. That's T-E-R-R-A-N-C-E-U-S. You can also follow me over on Instagram at the same handle. Um, I am kind of stepping away from Facebook. So I'm doing kind of a Facebook cleanse right now to where I deleted the app from my device, from from my phone, from my mobile devices. Um, I only use it on desktop now, which is has been really a tough process to go through because I was always on Facebook every single day, every day. Um, but I still check it. I, st- I still check it like once every other day or, you know, sometimes once a day, depending on uh, my schedule and things like that. But uh, if you guys are just fed up with Facebook altogether, like I recommend you delete the app from your phone or if you can't delete the app, at least turn off notifications and it really helps out like a hundred percent, you guys. Like no joke there. Oh, I'm so envious of you that you just <laughs> like took it off your phone. I have to have it for like work. Right. Otherwise I would definitely like not use it. But I find myself on Facebook so often and it's just so not good for my mental health, probably. Yeah, I Facebook or Twitter for that matter. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> uh I I you know, I'm kind of I'm trying to see if I can do it. Um, it's been about a month so far. So I think I've gotten over that 20-day edge that helps you break a habit. Um, and, and I don't find myself missing it as much as I thought I would. So if you're looking to do that or you're looking for tips, you know, i would migrated over to Twitter. So follow me over on Twitter. I'll be happy to talk to you guys about it. We'd like to thank Sydney for joining us this week. Sydney, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. No. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank me. Yes. Uh, but really, thank you, Sydney. You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Never ending thank you. Right. So much gratitude. But anyway, that does it for this week's episode of Hogwarts Radio. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Once again, I'm Terrence Pinkston. And I'm Gretchen Rush. And that does it for this week's episode. We'll see you next week for episode 230. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye now. That was bloody brilliant. Codswallop.